Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for coming to see a little bit about all of our Germany uh, trip. We have uh, a lot of memories from it. The, looking over the pictures was really helpful in remembering all what happened because it was a jam-packed uh, 11 days. And so we have uh, Lori and Kelly who are along. Kelly's mom, Karen, also is along. So uh, that is, is wonderful that uh, all of you could be with me for that too. So if you want to add anything, you certainly can, uh, by all means. As we get started, we're actually going to start not with Martin Luther, but with Johannes Gutenberg. Uh, and it's very fitting because the Reformation was something bigger than even Martin Luther alone, and really couldn't have happened quite the same way without the printing press. So Johannes Gutenberg was born in 1400, and he was a German blacksmith, goldsmith, printer, and publisher who uh, introduced printing to Europe. He invented the printing press and movable type, uh, and because he did that, they were able to spread through the printed page ideas to people that otherwise would never have heard of all that happened. Uh, not even the 95 Theses would have been uh, publicized nearly as much had they not been printed and dispersed. So we began our trip, our journey in Mainz, where we saw the Gutenberg Museum. And uh, this is one of the oldest museums of printing in the world, although they have a new updated building that we saw as part of our tour. Uh, here we see a little more modern oops, uh, version uh, of the printing press than Martin Luther would have used. But you get the idea. They wouldn't let me take pictures in the best parts of the museum, unfortunately. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> so after we went to, to there, we next went to the Wartburg Castle. You see the, the entrance, as it were, uh, going over what was kind of like a moat. I don't know the actual name of that. You can see the chain there, whether or not that lifted a drawbridge. I don't know, but this is an actual castle. The Wartburg Castle, according to legend, we heard about Louis the Jumper. Remember Louis the Jumper and what he did? He found that location a long time ago in 1067 while he was hunting in that area. And according to legend, he said, Wait, mountain, thou shalt bear me a castle, which is a play on the German word berg and berg, which means mountain and city. <laughs> so. Uh, that is, or mountain and castle. So uh, that is um, how, according to legend, it started, and in, in a particular way it started. He had his men carry dirt from his property, since this wasn't on his territory, and dump it on the mountain. Then he had 12 of his knights stand on the spot, stick their swords in the ground, and swear that the soil that they were standing on belong to Louis the Jumper. <laughs> That's how he acquired that property. Uh, one famous story from the Wartburg is that St. Elizabeth of Hungary was sent there by her mother to be wed to the landgrave Ludwig IV of Thuringia at the age of 14. From 1211 to 1228, she lived there in the castle and was renowned for her charitable work. She fed the people down below. And so we'll look at some pictures of the castle. You can see it's up high on a hill. There are even some cannons that are there. And as we look at the castle, you can see even in this black and white picture that is way high up. And there's a little thing for the drawbridge as well. Uh, and uh, looking at this area here, you can see uh, up there on top is the area of the castle that's actually named after Elizabeth of Hungary. So she was concerned with the people in the village below taking them food. Once she was approached uh, because of the concern of her stealing from the castle and giving it to the people in the village and asked to open up her basket, 
And then there was the famous miracle when she opened her basket. It wasn't the bread that she put there, but it was actually roses that they found. And that is one of the miracles by which she uh, attained, according to the Catholic Church, her sainthood. Even after that, her husband uh, died in the Crusades and she got her dowry back, but she used all of that worldly wealth to buy a hospital and care for those who were sick, living at virtually as a nun the rest of her life in poverty. She left a big impression on Martin Luther, uh, and um, here is the, the tower, the Belvedere, that I went up, and here is that hallway uh, in that area named after Elizabeth, and as we traveled there, even though I couldn't take pictures inside there either, I nevertheless, when I got to this room, couldn't resist taking a picture surreptitiously, because this is the room where Martin Luther uh, did the work while he was there. Um, of translating the Bible from Greek into German for the New Testament. So, from May 1521 to March 1522, Martin Luther stayed at the castle under the name of Junker Jorg, the Knight George, which we learned from our guide, Arthur, that he wasn't a very good knight at all. He wasn't that kind of outdoorsy person that it required, but he was there under disguise. He had been abducted and taken there by his allies. So uh, he was there for his safety at the request of Frederick the Wise following his excommunication by Pope Leo X and his refusal to recant at the Diet of Worms. It was during this period that he translated the Greek into the New Testament German in just 10 weeks. So this is his famous room uh, where he did his work. Now, there is a story about that room that he, um, like many people of his day, was afraid of the devil and the evil angels and was often tormented by them, uh, attributing his depression or mood swings to these evil angels. And the legend is that he was harassed by the devil one night there in the Wartburg, and in battle against Satan, he took his ink bottle and threw it at the devil, and it hit the wall and left an ink stain there. Um, how, however, uh, they found that the ink stain had been put up by people much later than Luther, uh, time and time again, and people would scrape it off the wall after hearing the story again and again. Now I don't think you can really see much of an ink stain there at all. And in fact, Luther was probably talking more about uh, using the ink of writing uh, his translation of the New Testament to do battle against the Satan. And I thought of that um, as I was there, I was asked to do a sermon on Sunday, and we were on the bus, so I gave my sermon on the bus. They said it was a moving experience. <laughs> <laughs> but in the process of writing that sermon, I, uh, I thought of Luther and his hours that he spent translating uh, the Greek into the New Testament German. And in fact, as Luther translated that New Testament into German, he, like Elizabeth, so long before him, would actually go down into the village and just listen to how people talked in their everyday language. Uh, and before this, even though there were other translations, other Bibles, and uh, people really didn't have access to be able to understand, especially the, the, the Greek of the uh, New Testament, in their own just everyday language in a way that was able to be widely distributed and widely understood by the masses. They, um, as we went from church to church there, most people before that really were dependent upon like the artwork of the churches uh, as their only New Testament. That's how they learned all the Bible stories was looking at the stained glass windows and um, being able to read, of course, the Bible in your own way of talking 
is something that is very powerful and literally changed not only the, the faith of very many people, but left a, an indelible imprint on the German language itself. And it, it's hard to imagine, perhaps, in our day and age, of a, a solitary monk in a little room like this with an ink and a pen and a paper writing something down in just a matter of weeks that would change history and change all of our lives, indeed, forever. Um, they had kind of um, a, like a little laser light show, so that's all of this stuff that you see on the wall there that really wasn't up on the wall. Uh, and the furniture is not original, although it goes way back, except for maybe in the lower right corner you can see a vertebrae of a whale uh, that would have been used as a footstool. <laughs> kind of interesting. Uh, here is kind of the outside of that area of the castle, and again the entrance, and a few other shots. Here you can see, uh, looking out from that tower, uh, seeing the countryside below, and Luther said that he was in the land of the birds because he was uh, so far up in the uh, air. And it kind of had a double meaning that um, at that time his life was in danger. Uh, he could have been hunted down like uh, a bird as well. So as we went along on our trip, we saw many other places. Um, and the next place we went is to um, the uh, Eisenach Luther House. So we got to Eisenach and we saw uh, the churches there, uh, in, including um, where Luther, at this particular church, uh, attended uh, school and sang in the um, choir there as a schoolboy. Um, he also ha uh, had his room and his board nearby in this um, particular house, uh, and now it houses a museum where there's a lot of artwork, uh, handwritten uh, books and Bibles and all kinds of carvings and things, a, a desk where a, a, a student would have been working next to the window there with a book opened on it, a statue of the reformer. Um, one thing he did especially enjoy there was the music. You can see this lute that was at the museum and he was known to uh, play that particular instrument and uh, was one of his favorite ways of chasing away the devil. Another picture of the Luther house there and the sign that is outside it. Uh, and even a little cat that was watching us as we strolled by his window. Not only for Luther is this important, of course, but also Johann Sebastian Bach uh, has this as his birthplace. And even though this isn't the original house, at one time it was assumed that it was. And there is the Bach house there as well, which is a museum for all things Bach. After that, we went to really not a Luther place, but uh, a very surprisingly moving place for me, and an amazing city, was Berlin. And here in uh, Berlin, uh, we saw a lot of different sites here. I'll go through some of them here as we talk about it. Uh, here is the Charlottenburg Palace. It was originally uh, commissioned by Sophie Charlotte, the wife of Frederick, Friedrich III, Elector of Brandenburg, in what was then the village of Lietzau. Uh, she died in 1705, and Friedrich named the palace and his estate Charlottenburg uh, in her memory. In the following years, uh, they added to it, uh, and, and it is now very, very ornate. One interesting thing about this um, Palace is, in addition to being the largest of such things in Berlin, also it had a very famous feature called an orangery. Does anyone know what an orangery is? Well, uh, they like to have orange trees, except if you know Germany, that really isn't the climate for oranges during the winter especially. 
So they had all of their trees on wheels, and then they brought them inside into the orangery during the winter. <laughs> so that was rather interesting that they did that. And um, they actually sent the architect who spruced it up to, I think, France to look how they did palaces there. And he came back with his input, and they added all of the fancy things that you see there. And there's that impressive statue out front as well. Also, uh, there is the Victory Column that was designed originally by Heinrich Strack uh, after 1864 to commemorate the Prussian victory in the Dano-Prussian War. Uh, by the time it was inaugurated on September 2nd, 1873, Prussia had also defeated Austria and its German allies in the Austro-Prussian War and France in the Franco-Prussian War. So now this statue had a new purpose to commemorate all of the victories in battle that they had won. And so if you look there, you can see the golden rings around it are all cannons that they captured from their enemies and used in this um, statue, uh, putting um, the, the goddess of victory up on top of the statue. The, the Nazis also used this. Um, they relocated the column to where it stands today, a large intersection on the city axis that leads from the former uh, Berliner Stadtschloss, the Berlin City Palace, through the Brandenburg Gate to the western parts of the city. Uh, they probably had hoped to uh, elaborate it further after their victories in the um, uh, World War II, but that thankfully did not happen. And so the, the final um, row uh, is not cannons uh, or, or adorned in such a way indicating a victory. And so now this statue has a very different uh, commemorative purpose. All right, so I kind of um, was talking about political things, and so here is another famous building in Berlin, which is the Reichstag. It was opened in 1894 and housed the Diet, which is kind of, I guess, maybe like their Congress in a way, until 1933, when it was severely damaged after being set on fire. Uh, the fire was uh, on the 27th of February, 1933, under rather suspicious circumstances, but the fire was important in that it gave the Nazis the pretext to um, have a decree allowing them to uh, arrest communists and have power to do police action uh, through, throughout um, Germany. So it was kind of the beginning of their takeover of power uh, that uh, th this building um, was a part of. Um, Hitler's strategy was to portray himself as an anti-communist in order to try to get people on his side, which is part of why there was that whole appeasement, as it's called, of so many world leaders uh, when the Nazis were beginning to take power. Um, now, of course, um, it has been rebuilt and, and refurbished uh, and after its completion, now it is once again the meeting place of the German parliament, the modern, modern uh, Bundestag. Uh, so it has uh, a lot of history to it, and now it's actually a, a symbol of the, the rebuilding, revitalization of Berlin and the unification of Berlin. And the Brandenburg Gate is another monument that has many meanings throughout history in Berlin. Um, it, uh, was at, at one time, uh, of course, uh, part of the, the Nazi backdrop, but uh, since that time, uh, after being a symbol of the Cold War, because the uh, Berlin Wall went, this was part of the Berlin Wall, basically. You can see on the street uh, right next to it where the Berlin Wall was and, um, uh, and the river nearby. And um, uh, this, of course, is, is where the famous tear down that wall speech was made. And so again, it has 
um, a, a new and updated meaning to it, symbolizing the, the reunification of, of Berlin. And uh, even though it's a very um, impressive looking structure modeled after the entrance to the Acropolis in Greece, uh, now it, uh, it has a meaning all of its own after having been uh, rebuilt. After World War II, it, it was partially destroyed, but left standing enough to where they were able to rebuild it. Uh, so that is the Brandenburg Gate. Also, we saw the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe, uh, which was a very moving memorial. Um, according to the designer, uh, it was to represent an ordered system that lost touch with human reason, uh, as uh, happened with the Nazi party. Uh, also, uh, even though it's not part of the official uh, rationale for it, it, it does have uh, a very uh, vivid um, sense to it of being a graveyard for all of the Jews that were murdered and, and not originally given uh, a grave of their own other than a mass grave that they were thrown into. It can be a very moving, very profound experience of, of isolation being inside this memorial, uh, cut off in, in a way from the rest of the city. Uh, also, the, the um, uh, former uh, Berlin Wall, part of it still stands, it's called the East Side Gallery. There was a gentleman there that was uh, doing some of his music there, playing his accordion or concertina, I'm not sure which that is. Uh, and he was uh, excited to have me take a picture. Uh, all throughout the wall, uh, there are different pieces of uh, artwork that have been painted on the wall, some of them more famous than others, some in better shape than others, but I think it is still probably the largest, longest standing open air gallery in, in the world. Also, when we got to a certain place, we saw um, something that is called uh, the, the Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial um, Church. And uh, this was a church that uh, suffered extensive bombing during World War II, but not so much that uh, it completely fell into um, utter ruin. Uh, however, uh, during the Cold War, uh, they just kind of left the thing standing because they weren't that interested in church, <laughs> to be honest. And um, so uh, when they came back together, when Germany was unified and Berlin was unified, um, they uh, began working on it, uh, originally going to tear down that structure, but there was such an outcry that they left it standing. Um, you can see there uh, that there are some bubbles that are in the air. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. I inside the old structure, you can see on the ceiling this mosaic, some of the artwork that was preserved there, and a, a chalice that had been used for communion and a cross. Uh, the beautiful uh, modern uh, portion of it, which I guess kind of Ger uh, Berliners think that it's a, a pillbox and a lipstick <laughs> is what the modern building looks like. This would be in the pillbox. It's kind of a sanctuary with the, the um, uh, suspended uh, risen Jesus uh, there uh, and the, the mostly blue stained glass windows. I actually burst into tears when I walked into this room and saw it for the first time. There you can see uh, the organ in the back. Yeah, I'll let you see that a little bit more, which is amazing, isn't it? Outside, uh, you could see that this man, I don't know if it was the father or, or the person that was uh, having the bubble sticks for everybody, but there was this little girl that was transfixed there. I thought it was a very poignant scene because if you remember just a little before Christmas uh, last year, um, there was an incident outside this particular church. Uh, they have famous Christmas markets throughout Berlin, and this was the Christmas market where there was that terrorist attack. Um, the driver of a, a truck was um, assassinated, as truck hijacked and driven into a crowd of people. Um, uh, there were um, many people that lost their life, many people that were injured 
And so there still is quite a police presence there today. Um, we had to move our bus in a big hurry because they didn't like our bus uh, being there and the police were right on us. But uh, uh, it's amazing how the place has been transformed since that time. Also, while we were in Ber Berlin, we got to see the Pergamon Museum, where um, here you can see uh, a portion of the, the famous uh, uh, Babylonian uh, and, and Assyrian artwork, uh, the Ishtar Gate. Um, uh, and, and if you read about Ashtaroth poles in the Bible, that's the same false god uh, that was used in different forms by many different cultures back then, but um, they were able to bring back the brick and, and then to, um, in their own way, reconstruct the Ishtar Gate. This is the most heavily attended museum on a whole island of museums uh, in Berlin. About five million people go to see it every year. There's a reproduction of the Code of Hammurabi, which is one of the earliest law codes and some other uh, artwork and, and the gate there, the Pergamon Altar, which is the most famous exhibit, was being worked on, so we couldn't see that. But there were plenty of other things that we saw there. Um, here, a giant statue of the god of weather, as they called it. Here is another scene with um, actually a uh, could be a depiction of a, a Hebrew person on the right and a, the symbol for the moon god actually um, up in the top center of that. So you can see the, the false gods that were very uh, uh, common at the time. And it's kind of hard to tell from, from the inscription, but this might be on the right a, represent, a representation of Barak in the Bible. Uh, here, even though it doesn't really look like a bird, this is a giant bird that probably sat on top of a pole. And uh, this is the, the victory um, illustration that they had. If, if you remember in the Bible, um, the people of Israel uh, unfortunately did not trust in God to give uh, his aid. And they looked to the Egyptians for help against the Assyrians. This is what happened. The Egyptians are pictured on the right, bowing to the Assyrians who won the victory. Uh, they were wrong to trust in, in men, to trust in, in the nation of Egypt. They could not protect them against the Assyrians, and the northern kingdom, of course, was carted away never to return and form the Jewish diaspora. Also, there's a portion of the uh, um, museum that is uh, devoted to um, Muslim uh, artwork and artifacts as well. Here is um, kind of a, a booth that was, was very, very fancy from Aleppo, from a merchant there uh, way back in the day, and now it's in this museum. Here's just the colonnade that's on the outside of the museum. Also, some historical things that we saw were, in, in Potsdam, we saw that bridge where they met in the middle and exchanged prisoners. Uh, uh, also, uh, where the famous conference was. And there's a star there that uh, Stalin had put in to intimidate the other world leaders uh, at the meeting. There was a lot of, it was a big chess match, basically, that was going on. Then we got to Wittenberg. We saw the Black Cloister, and there in the Black Cloister is where uh, Luther was teaching for a while, and um, this is where he um, eventually uh, found his home. So here uh, he, uh, of course, um, had uh, the kind of a rapid about phase from being by himself to um, having a wife. And so, uh, with the Reformation going, they uh, had some nuns that no longer were nuns. They were snuck out in pickle barrels, and they found nuns for everybody except for one of them. And this was Catherine von Bora. She was actually an engaged to be married to somebody else, but uh, cruelly rejected uh, because she wasn't 
apparently of the right social status for this other person that she was going to marry. So she became Luther's wife. And um, what a wife she was. She basically, th you know, this is the, the former uh, place where <laughs> you can see the building there. And Katie took care of all of this, uh, doing everything from making beer to raising children all there. And uh, this little door that's down there is a door that she gave uh, to Luther for one of his birthdays. Uh, here is the old ruins of actually what was a bathroom. <laughs> and you can see that there. Inside, there is a very interesting museum with all kinds of artwork. Here's uh, Lucas Cranach, who was behind many of the paintings that we see. Here is Luther uh, with his uh, family. And uh, people in that day just didn't, weren't fathers like we think of them now. They weren't very interested in their wife or their children or their family. Luther was very, very different uh, than that. In fact, um, for Luther, uh, most Germans think of him not as a theologian, but someone that showed them how to live everyday life. And here is an example of that. Here is a, a wood carving of the beer making process with Katie supervising. Here is uh, the tower in the black cloister and an illustration of Luther as Junker Jorg. Uh, here is an interesting bit of artwork comparing Luther to Huss. Um, some hymns that Luther wrote as well in the museum and picture of Luther and Catherine von Fora. And here's their daughter Magdalena. And um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about her real quick. Uh, Martin Luther married Catherine von Bora in 1525. They had six children, Hans, Elizabeth, Magdalena, Martin, Paul, and Margarita. And in 1542, they sent their eldest son, Hans, at the age of 16, to Torgau to be educated. Just after he arrived there, uh, he received a letter from his father asking him to return home. My daughter, Magdalena, is nearing her end and will soon go to her true father in heaven unless he sees fit to spare her. She longed so much to see her brother, for they were very close. So I am sending a carriage for him in the hope that a sight of him will revive her. I am doing all I can, lest afterwards the thought of having neglected anything should torment me. Please ask him to come at once without telling him why. I shall send him back as soon as she has either fallen asleep in the Lord or been restored to health. Farewell in the Lord. So Hans returned home, but his sister's health continued to deteriorate. Luther prayed, O oh God, I love her dearly, but thy will be done. He asked her, Magdalena, my little girl, would you like to stay with your father here? And would you like... And would you just as gladly go to your father in heaven? And Magdalena answered, Yes, dearest father, as God wills. For all his might in theology and the Reformation, Martin was disconsolate, however. On the 20th of September, 1542, kneeling at her bedside, praying through tears with Katie, standing at the end of the bedroom, unable to watch her die in Martin's arms, she died. Martin said to Katie, Dearest Katie, let us think of the home of our daughter has gone to. There she is happy and at peace. As Magdalena was laid in the coffin, Luther said, My darling, you will rise and shine like the stars in the sun. He turned to Katie and said, How strange to know that she is at peace and all is well and yet to be sorrowful. Luther wrote the epitaph for her grave. Here I, Magdalena, Dr. Luther's little maid, resting with the saints, sleep in my narrow bed. I was a child of death, for I was born in sin, but now I live redeemed, Lord Christ, by the blood you shed for me. Three days later, he wrote to his friend, Justice Jonas, I expect you have heard that my beloved Magdalena has been born again into Christ's everlasting kingdom. Although my wife and I ought not rejoice because of her happy end, yet such is the strength of natural affection that we cannot think of it without sobs and groans which tear, tear the heart apart. The memory of her face, her words, her expressions in life and death, everything about our most obedient and loving daughter lingers in our hearts so that even the death of Christ and what are all deaths compared to his is almost powerless to lift our minds above our loss. So would you give thanks to God in our stead? For hasn't he honored us greatly in glorifying our child? So that picture there is a, a very um, moving picture to think of all of that. There's a dining room table where they ate and had many conversations that are recorded in 
Luther's table talks, a, a stove in the corner to warm it. Uh, um, this is the, the Deutsche Messe, the liturgy in German that Luther wrote. Notice the hymnal that they had and how different that is than our hymnals. Here is a catechism uh, that was printed that Luther wrote and a better illustration of a printing press. Here is uh, Luther and Katie. And here is the door of the castle church in Wittenberg where Luther uh, affixed his 95 theses to. We got to see that. Uh, and I don't know if you can tell there, but there was a little bat that also found a home on that door. <laughs> At that particular moment, the inside of the church there, uh, very uh, beautiful and ornate. There's the pulpit. Uh, there is actually the grave there where Luther was buried and more of the artwork, more um, memorials to people who were buried there, uh, quite a, a, a structure, quite a, a building. I, um, and there is the, the city church, uh, which is very different. Um, I went out the next morning and had a little walk, saw the sunrise. Actually, the street from the Black Cloister to the uh, church it is a very uh, s small distance to walk, and you can see it in the sunlight there. And um, this is where Luther reportedly was known to sit and have a beer, much to the chagrin of his wife, who would much rather that he drank the beer that she made. <laughs> the bus is by where we stayed there. Here's Melanchthon's house on the street there, and this is where um, Luther burned the papal bull. That, that condemned his, uh, his works, his, his 95 theses, and so forth. So as, as we went on, we saw uh, many other places, Eisleben, where Luther was born and wh where he was baptized. Here is the church there in uh, commemoration. I love some of the artwork on the church. Uh, and you can see the, the house uh, where that his parents rented, where he was born there, and a museum showing artwork that was uh, used at the funerals of people, depicting various biblical scenes. Uh, and um, I'm not sure if this is the actual baptismal font used for Luther, but one very similar to it, certainly. And this is interesting. They, um, this is Luther's death mask of his face and hands. Our guide pointed out that if you look at the right hand, you can see that um, his fingers are like curved from all the writing he did. Uh, most people don't realize he just how he wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. In fact, that's why he liked the bathroom so much, is he could write there. And uh, so like every spare moment he was writing. Now, I think this is a, a plastic cast of a plaster reproduction of the original death mask. So it's not too gross, even though it's kind of different than our sensibilities would otherwise allow. And, and a painting of where Luther died as well. A, a, a sermon uh, a, a, that he wrote on facing death confidently. Uh, and also a little work that he wrote for um, people that wondered what about children who die before they're baptized. And in this work, he said that he believed and trusted in the mercy of God. A uh, picture of his wife. And when he died, people didn't just leave their property to their wife. They had um, someone else in charge of their property. But not Luther. He left it to Katie. And it was so unusual that he actually wrote to the prince to have him vouch for him that this was indeed his will. That's the kind of um, relationship they had. Here you can see uh, where he was working, uh, or a representation of it anyways, up to his dying day and the, the bed where he died upon. Uh, and uh, I guess, I'm not sure of the fancy name for this, but kind of like a casket, I guess. And you can see that room there, which wasn't the original room. Here is the pulpit in the church where he preached <laughs> four sermons before he um, finally died. He, he was working right up to the, the very end. And you can see that, that church there as well, uh, talking about the um, birth of Luther on, the, on that uh, statue there. Um, then we went to Leipzig, saw where Bach was at, at St. Thomas Church. I'll go through them kind of quickly. You can see there, Luther also preached there on his way. Um, uh, 
uh, back from the Diet of Worms, and also in, in Leipzig there, that's where he had his famous debate with Eck that didn't go so well, but nevertheless made him very, very popular. You can see more of the buildings there in Dresden, uh, a famous uh, Lutheran church there in Dresden that was beautiful. Uh, in Dresden there was also the processional of um, famous people then in, in the mural, and we also saw what's called the Pleasure Palace, which was purely hedonistic <laughs> and nothing to do with Luther whatsoever, but uh, an amazing building nonetheless. And uh, finally in Dresden there we saw um, some actors who were part of Vesta Semper opera behind them. And interestingly, if you look up here, there's a saying back around January, they had kind of a counter protest there against the far right wing in Germany who um, is kind of making a lot of people uncomfortable there, uh, saying that the w world is looking and they want to be, now here, the counter protest is saying they want to have Germany be a welcoming place for the world. But uh, they were passing out playbills for their play and they were very happy to, to talk and have me take their, their picture. They were very, very proud of that. Not many people seemed to be paying attention to them, so when I took their picture they were really happy. <laughs> and I saw my name a lot over there in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> so that is really, I, I have a lot more pictures, but uh, not a lot of time yet to show you everything. Um, if you're not a friend on Facebook, please do send me a friend request and I, I'll have a lot more pictures up there and maybe I'll also record part two to this and make that available with the help of Dana. Thank you, Dana, for videoing it for us today. Thank you all for being here. And I have to run, unfortunately, now. It's a very busy morning for me. I, I was ringing bells in the bell choir and now it's time to warm up with the choir choir uh, before the next service and also warm up with the worship band. But thank you, thank you, thank you for coming very much.